Mamish, I have no idea what to do with that intro. I'm still trying to figure out <laughs> exactly how it relates to me. I'm a Kabul the Musser, I appreciate it. I really want to, I want to thank Stewie and Baker Donaldson for hosting this Lunch and Learn. Baruch Hashem, we've been doing this already for a little while. And although when we've been downtown, it's happened at different places, the last couple of Lunch and Learns that we've had, Baruch Hashem, have been hosted here. And Stewie, we thank you and the firm for such incredible and gracious Hachnasas Archen. Thank you. I also want to thank Josh Erez, John Beer, who are also dedicating and sponsoring this year today. Thank you very much. A very special thank you to Maishi Abramson. We're now going, apparently, we're streaming live. Baruch Hashem, as a result of, of Maishi, who really contributes the technical know-how to everything we do in the shul and beyond. A thank you, of course, to our executive director, to Julia Shainman, who always is... The truth is, runs everything, Baruch Hashem, and coordinates everything. Julia, we thank you so much for all of the work you put into everything we do. So what I'd like to try to share with you for a few minutes this afternoon is a little bit of an insight into the Haggadah. You know, I was, as we were riding up on the elevator, I was remarking to some of the people that there's so much to study in the Haggadah, and often it's hard to know what it is that one should focus on. Because on one hand, again, if one is leading a Seder especially, so one of them, we have to figure out what's going to interest the kids, what's going to interest the guests, what's going to interest people. On the flip side, I want to prepare, as we mentioned before, I need to prepare for Pesach, not just the cleaning, but in the spiritual sense as well. So what should I prepare? What should I focus on? What part of the Haggadah, what narrative, what story draws our attention? And I think for many of us, we relate differently to different parts of the Haggadah. For some of us, we relate to parts of the Haggadah that remind us of our childhood. We relate to parts of the Haggadah which perhaps we relate a little bit to the tunes, to the nigunim. And then other times, we relate to the Haggadah through the narrative or through the story that's expressed. So I want to share with you today a piece of the Haggadah that is very well known. And it's well known because it's one of the eating parts of the Seder. After all of the talking and after all of the reading, when we begin to eat. And if you take a look at number one, by way of introduction to this section in the Haggadah, we have a Gemara. Amru Allah al Hillel. They said about Hillel, Shahaya Karachan Bebas Achaz Va'ochlan. That Hillel would take the Matzah, the Maror, and the Karban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb, and he would go ahead and eat them all together. Karachan Bebas Achaz, he would wrap them together and he would eat them. Shene Emar. Uh, matzos umerorim yochluhu. Because the Pasuk says, you shall eat it, the it being a reference to the Paschal lamb, the Karban Pesach, you shall eat it together with matzah and maror. Am Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan said, Cholkin alav chaveirav al Hillel. Hillel's friends disagreed with him. Hillel's friends did not believe that this was the proper manner of consumption of the Paschal lamb. In fact, they felt, Yochol yehei karcham babas achaz va'ochlan kaderach shila achlan, Talmud Lomar, Amatos Mram Yochlu. So the Gemara then records a dispute. And the dispute was the rabbis, everyone else besides Hillel felt that this was not the way to consume the Paschal lamb. In fact, the way to consume the Paschal lamb is you eat the carbon Pesach by itself, you eat matzah by itself, you eat maror by itself. So fundamental dispute. And by the way, not only that, we're not going to get too much into the halachic technicalities here, but according to the rabbis, they felt that Hillel was not only wrong, but in fact, if you go ahead and you consume the Paschal lamb and matzah and maror in this way, you have not fulfilled your obligations. The Vilna Gon, the Gra, in his commentary on this Gemara says that there's a concept of tam, me, tam in mevatlin zu at zu. Tastes has the ability to negate one another. So therefore the Gra, the Vilna Gon, is actually of the opinion that the rabbis didn't just procedurally disagree with Hillel, they fundamentally disagree with Hillel. They said, Hillel, if you consume the Paschal lamb this way, not only is it not preferred, but you actually have not even fulfilled your obligation. So fundamental dispute between Hillel and between the rabbis. Interestingly enough, how do we pass in halacha l'maysa, practically speaking? The Rambam codifies the opinion, not of Hillel, but in fact codifies the opinion of the rabbis. That on the night of, the, on the night of Passover, night of Pesach, in the temple, in the Beis HaMikdash, if you had your Paschal lamb, your matzah, and your maror, in fact, you would consume each of them individually. We do not wrap it up just as an aside, Rabbi Soloveitchik points out to me something very interesting. So, you know, we do this korek, we do this sandwich at the, uh, at the Seder, and what generally happens when you attempt to make your Hillel sandwich? 
it's a culinary disaster, right? You, you, right? you, you put, make this very beautiful sandwich with some lettuce or whatever you use for maror, some shmuramats, a little bit of charoses, and you take one bite, and what happens? Done. It's all done, right? It, it's everywhere but on your plate, right? It's everywhere but in your mouth, and it's everywhere. So Salvechi actually points out something very interesting. He says, you see from here clearly that in the times of the temple, they had soft matzos. They did not have shmura matzah like we have today. They had matzah, which was probably more like a lafa. And if you think about it, by the way, and like a wrap, and if you think about it that way, by the way, it turns out that what was Hillel essentially eating? He was eating a shawarma, right? So you have the paschal lamb, which is lamb, right? You have ultimately this wrap. You have some lettuce, because that's what they used in the times of the Talmud. They did not use like horseradish root like some of us use today. They used lettuce. So he essentially was eating a wrap, right? A carbon paste sock wrap. So just an interesting historical. Today, the soft matzahs are once again re-emerging in, in popularity, much more by the Sfardim than by Ashkenazim, but nevertheless interesting to note. So again, you have this incredible halachic dispute, dispute regarding Jewish law. The rabbi is saying each item must be consumed on its own. Hillel is saying, no, you have to consume them all together. The Rambam Maimonides holds like the rabbis, we eat them separately. Yet, we know that at the Seder, we go out of our way to recreate the Hillel sandwich. And if you take a look at number two, it's a quote from the Haggadah, Zecher Lemikdash Kehillel. We do this to remember that which was done in the temple by Hillel. This is what Hillel did when the temple stood. He would take his carbon Pesach, his matzah and his maror. And what would he do? He would wrap them all together and he would eat them as one. Because Hillel felt this was the fulfillment of the verse. So what's the problem? The problem is, we have built into the Haggadah something that was never accepted as normative practice. Remember again, we have a dispute in the Talmud, which is not, not, not unique, right? There are always disputes in the Talmud. We have resolution of that dispute. Maimonides rules. We do not hold like Hila, we hold like the rabbis. We eat Pesach separate, uh, carbon Pesach separately, Matzah separately, Mara separately, not like Hila. So the Rambam does not paskin, does not hold like Hila, yet, when it comes to the observance of our Pesach Seder, we build in this practice of Hillel. And the question, of course, is, question, of course, is, why? Always a safe question when anything to do with Judaism, right? Why? Well, I don't understand. This is not, there are a million different opinions on a million different things. And we don't build, especially on Pesach, especially at the Seder, about so many details. Yet, we only conduct our Seder, we conduct ourselves in accordance with the accepted approach, the accepted majority opinion. Yet, here at the Seder, and just understand what we've done already. We've eaten, by the time we get to this part of the Seder, we've already consumed our matzah, we've consumed our maror. Remember again, afikoman, which represents the Paschal lamb, the Karma Pesach, we're going to eat later on. And yet we go out of our way to make the Hillel sandwich. We go out of our way to go ahead and bring all of these items together and eat them together. And the question is why? So the obvious answer is because there's a lesson to be taught. Meaning, even if we don't accept Hillel's premise from a mechanistic, halachic, Jewish law perspective, even if we reject Hillel's approach to fulfilling the actual mitzvah, the rabbis clearly felt that Hillel's approach conveys an important message, a message which we are obligated to internalize. And so the question I'd like to try to explore a little bit for a few moments this afternoon is even if we don't accept Hillel's approach, <laughs> halacha lamaisa, practically speaking, what is the deeper message that Hillel was trying to convey to us through the matzah maror, Karban Pesach sandwich. And so I'd like to share with you two approaches. The first is Rabbi Sachs. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in his commentary on the Haggadah, which is an exceptional, exceptional comment. Rabbi, Rabbi Sachs is an exceptional thinker. And his commentaries on the Haggadah are just overwhelmingly amazing. See, writes as follows. He says, the bottom matzah is now taken. This is the section, by the way, that we know as Korech, the making of the Hillel sandwich. The bottom matzah is now taken. Each participant takes two pieces and between them places maror, which has been dipped in charoses. No blessing is made, since we have already made the blessings over the matzah and the mar separately. It appears that there was a difference of opinion between Hillel and his contemporaries as to whether the matzah and maror should be eaten separately 
or together. The view that they should be eaten separately holds that these are distinctive commands, neither of which should diminish or detract from the other. Matzah symbolizes freedom, Mora represents slavery, they have different tastes, they are opposite experiences, they do not belong together. So this was the approach of the rabbis. There are different experiences over the night of the Seder. There is Mara, which represents the bitterness of servitude. There is Matzah, which represents the bread of freedom. There is Karban Pesach, which represents the first meal that we enjoyed as an emancipated free people. And each of these experiences are different. And not only and you're not allowed to bring them together. They're separate experiences. Remember again, over the course of the Seder, we begin the Seder experience as slaves, feeling like slaves, and then over the course of the evening, we experience freedom, emancipation, self-actualization. But it's a progression, and each stage must be quote-unquote enjoyed, or maybe better stated, experienced on their own. Comes along Hillel, and Hillel says something amazing. Hillel, however, thought otherwise. What was Hillel's approach? And that of respect for his opinion, we do as he did as well. Hillel was guided by his understanding of the biblical verse that one should eat the Paschal offering with matzos and bitter herbs, suggesting that all three be eaten together. What's Hillel's deeper message? Perhaps, too, he was reminding us of the Jewish experience of history. Within the bitterness of slavery, there was also the hope and promise of freedom. Within freedom, we are also commanded each year to never forget the taste of slavery, so that we should not take liberty for granted, nor forget those who are still afflicted. So this is absolutely amazing. What Rabbi Sachs posits that Hillel is actually saying is as follows. The fundamental dispute is how do you look at the continuum of the experiences of the human condition? According to the rabbis, there are separate experiences to be experienced one at a time. First there's matzah, then there's marar. The, the order is quite unique, that we start with matzah, then go to marar. But leaving that aside, first I start with the bitterness of slavery, then I transition to the bread of emancipation, ultimately again ending off the evening with the meal, the karma pesach of freedom. Hillel says no. In the Jewish experiential continuum, we experience all of these things together. The human condition is not a series of independent freeze frames. The human condition is all about the simultaneity, the experiential simultaneity, which means that when I am a slave, I am experiencing freedom. And when I am free, I am experiencing slavery. What, is, what does Rabbi Sachs mean by that? What he means is, what's the power of the Jewish people? What do you see? Pesach is the birth of our nation. And it's important to understand what the incredible power of our people is. Where, where, what is the power of the Jewish people? Rabbi Sex posits that our power is that even in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances, even in the midst of marur, I'm still tasting matzah. Even in the midst of servitude, I know that I'm going to experience freedom. Even in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances, I am confident and filled with incredible optimism that what? That what? That things will be okay. That I will live to see another day. That some way, somehow, I will navigate even out of the most tumultuous of circumstances. I literally feel the yoke of slavery on my back. I feel I'm living, I'm tasting the maror, but at the same time, I'm eating the matzah. That's the power of the Jew the ability to maintain optimism and an optimistic outlook, even in the midst of incredibly difficult life circumstances. The ability to eat matzah, or the, even when I'm tasting mar. And conversely, it's true as well. Shalom Aleichem Tzachim. There are sheets right, uh, right over here. And there's lunch. You're, you're yeshiva bachar. You got, you got a chaparain over here. So remember, understand what, what, what's happening over here. And the flip side is true as well which is, even when I go ahead and I eat matzah, even when I'm free, I still have to taste the maror. What, what, what does that mean? That even when life is perfect, even when everything is great, I have to remember that it's not great for everyone. Think about this for just a moment. You know, here, here we are, here we are, experiencing a beautiful lunch and learn. 
beautiful view. And by the way, this is an incredible thing because think about this lunch and learn and the continuum of the Jewish experience. Right? Less than 100 years ago, our people were being exterminated. And here we are, Baruch Hashem, in the middle, I'm sure, successful law firm? Yeah, Baruch Hashem, good. Halavai, this less of additional success, right? Filled with a room of, of, of professionals. Baruch Hashem, people who are successful, people making a name for themselves, literally, again, on the top of the world in so many different ways. Yet, you know what's happening in Eretz Yisrael as we speak right now? is the Levaya for Zachary Baumel. Zachary Baumel was returned to his people yesterday after 35 years, missing in action. His father, Zichon Levracha, died without knowing about the welfare of his son. His mother is 90 years old. So there's a Levaya for a soldier who was brought, brought back home after close to four decades of being away from his family. And as a people, we learn to absorb the simultaneity of emotional experience. So on one hand, I'm meeting my matzah. Today is a great celebratory day. Look at this. Look how beautiful this is. You know, sometimes it's so good that we forget we're in the diaspora. We forget that Mashiach has not yet come. We forget that although this is a golden age of Jewry, it's not the golden age of Jewry. But at the same time, how could my heart not break that there was a young man cut down in the prime of his life who was buried in some unknown grave, apparently in Syria now, but yet again, who was identified by his IDF tank overalls and by the tzitzis that were still on his body close to four decades later. That's what it means, tit matzah and maror at the same time. On one hand, again, I'm in a moment of incredible jubilation and celebration, freedom, but how does my heart not break? And you know what's amazing? If you read any of the news coming out of Israel the last day or so since they revealed this Operation Bittersweet Song to bring back the remains of these soldiers, there's a whole bunch of families. There's a whole bunch of families that now have renewed hope. And isn't it an amazing thing to think? You know, I see this often when people endure loss. When people endure a loss, you see this all the time. A family in your shul, a family in your community endures a loss. They sit shiva and there's an incredible outpouring of, of support. But I want to tell you what happens nine times out of ten, which is Shiva's over, and what happens? And what happens? Everyone goes back to their life. That's what happens. Everybody goes back to their life, and more often than not, people forget about the family who is suffering. N not chas shalom in an indifferent way. Not because we don't care, but that's the nature of the human condition. We kind of just, we get back into the swing of things. And I get back to my life, my life gets going, but yet, those hearts that were broken during Shiva are still broken, and often they're broken for many, many years, even after the community has gone back to its business. That's what it means to eat matzah and marah together. That even when my life is matzah, even when my life is great, even when things are going fantastically well, I have to be ever cognizant and aware of the marah, of the bitterness that is happening all around me. Says Rabbi Sachs, do you know what it means to be part of the Jewish people? It means you master the art of eating matzah and maror together. So if your life presently is in a state of maror, if things are difficult, don't only eat maror. Eat the matzah of optimism along with that and remind yourself and gird yourself with the strength that as difficult as things may be right now, it will get better. Maybe not the way you thought it would, maybe not how you thought it would or when you thought it would, but you'll make it through. You'll make it through. No matter how much murder you have going on, remind yourself to also eat the matzah. And if you're privileged to lead a matzah life, if you're privileged to lead a matzah life, things are going great for you, don't forget about all of the murder that's around you. Don't forget about the difficulties. Don't forget about the challenges. Don't forget about the adversity that is being experienced literally by so many right around us. That's Rabbi Sachs' understanding. And therefore, what Rabbi Sack says is that even though the halacha, Jewish law, does not accept the position of Hillel, again, from a halachic perspective, when Mashiach comes and we rebuild the temple, we're going to have the Paschal lamb, if you eat everything together, you have not fulfilled the mitzvot of the evening. So from a, halach, from a halachic, mechanistic perspective, we reject the position of Hillel. But from a hashkafic, 
from a life outlook perspective, Hillel is spot on. Life is all about eating your matzah and your maror together. If you're having a maror day, make sure you eat your matzah and keep your optimism with you. And if you're having a matzah day, just remember all of those who are living with maror. To take this a little bit further, if you take a look at number five on your sheet. So this is another beautiful Haggadah. This is a Haggadah with the commentary of Rav Shlomo Aviner. Rav Shlomo Aviner is the Rosh Hashiva of Ateret Kohanim in the old city of Yerushalayim. He's also a Rav in Beit El. And Rav Aviner is, is probably one of the, one of the greatest recognized post-Kim Talmidi Chachamim in the religious Zionist community in Eretz Yisrael. And Rav Aviner wrote a beautiful, beautiful commentary, a short commentary on the Haggadah. And he writes as follows. This is beautiful. He says, Amatzu Sumerorim, paragraph Aleph, five Aleph. Amatzu Sumerorim, he writes, Lechora, ein zem matim le'echo maror b'su'udas hadaya u'gu'ula. Ela ma'achalim ti'imim. So he says, you know, so much of the Pesach Seder is a celebration of freedom. So why are we even eating the maror altogether? Remember again, the Seder night is supposed to be, really supposed to represent a su'uda, a meal of royalty, of incredible royalty. That's why you know the halacha is, interestingly enough, the halacha is that throughout the entire year, you're never supposed to bring out all of your finest utensils. You don't, you don't empty out the break front. Even, you know, even for Shabbos, you don't open it, except one night of the year that you're allowed and you're encouraged to open up the break front. And that's when? Pesach night, which is interesting because so many times what ends up happening is we're using plastic or other stuff on, on Pesach, right? But the idea is Pesach is the time where you're supposed to bring out the best of the best. Why? Because of royalty. Beses asks Rav Avinar, if I'm royalty, what am I doing eating matzah? Excuse me, eating maror. He says, Ella, this is incredibly profound. Ella sha'asar l'ramos esatzmenu. But rather, writes Rav Avinar, it is prohibited to delude yourself. You can't live life in a state of delusion. What does that mean? Yesh ladas shebechayim yeshkam merirus. It's important to know that in life, there is maror. The kavachomer bederech l'geula. So Rav Avinir says something absolutely amazing. Do you know that there are record numbers of unhappy people in today's day and age, right? And isn't it amazing, right? We have found the cure to so many common diseases, right? There's more wealth available than ever. Technological advances are occurring at a breakneck speed, yet rates of unhappiness are at unprecedented levels. Isn't that amazing? So what's the pshat? Why is it that in a world, and especially in our society, which offers us so much, that there's so much unhappiness? So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure there are social psychologists who can answer it. I think the answer is because we have unrealistic expectations. You see, sometimes we go through life thinking that life is supposed to be all happy, that life is supposed to be easy, that life is supposed to be all okay. And so when stuff occurs, like maror, we're totally blindsided by it. I, I, can't, I can't believe this happened. What, what, what went wrong? What's the drug? And that's why I find it interesting. People suffer from crises of faith. Seemingly, it's amazing. You know, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and never once did I hear them question God. I get my tuition statement, and I hear people questioning the justness of God, right? How could it be, right? It's amazing. People suffer from theological crises. It's amazing over, over so many things. Why? It's because we have unrealistic expectations of life. We think life is supposed to be easy. That's our expectation. We think that life is supposed to be one big piece of matzah, that it's one big carbon Pesach, that things are supposed to be easy, that things are supposed to fall into place. We have an expectation that I'm supposed to be happy. Writes Rav Avinar, whoever said that life is supposed to be easy? Whoever said that life is one big piece of matzah? Where did you get that from? Maror is part of the nature of the human condition. There is difficulty. There is adversity. There is suffering. There are challenges. There are setbacks. And that is part of the human condition. And says Rav Aviner, if you try to tell yourself that life is just supposed to be easy, smooth sailing, then he says, Miramim es atzmenu. We are deluding ourselves. We are deluding ourselves. 
Maror, challenge, adversity, difficulty, tragedy, is part of the fabric of the human condition. But he goes on. Look at paragraph base. Ach, ein lit os me'idach yisa. But you have to be careful how you internalize that ideology as well. Einenu pessimim. Right? Pessimim. Right? So that's Hebrew. For what? We're not pessimistic. Right? We're not pessimistic either. Sheroi meruos pechol davar. You know, there are some people who are pessimistic and only see the bitterness in every single thing. Ela anu realistim. This is great, right? Apparently Hebrew also. We are realistim. What is realistim? We're realistic people. So he's amazing. So I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. But what does that mean? Ol yeser diuk, or to better say, listen to this one. Realistim idealistim. A lot of Hebrew today, right? We are idealistic realists. Idealistic realists. What does it mean to be an idealistic realist? You see, there are some people who are realists, but they're not really realists. They're deep cover pessimists, right? So they see everything in the world dark. I'm a realist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. You're not a realist, right? Nebuch, you're a pessimist in realist clothing. But you see everything, again, the way they look at people, everyone's out to get you, everyone's out to stab you in the back, right? People in general can't be trusted. And every life situation, it's only a question until the other shoe drops, right? Until the sky falls. I'm just being realistic. That's not realistic, that's pessimism. On the flip side, let's do what Rav Avinia writes. Ulu umasam, yesh hamachshivim atzmam la idealistim. There are other people who say, I'm idealistic. But they're not really idealistic. Shetsovim hakol bevarod. What does that mean? They look at everything through rose-colored glasses. So they're also not realistic. Because the world is not always rose-colored. Right? There's adversity, there's difficulty. There are good people, there are bad people. Not everyone is right. There are people who are right, there are people who are wrong. Right? Not, every, not everything ultimately, again, could be, so look what Ravavi Nyarga describes. There are two poles, so to speak, right? There are two ends of the spectrum. There are those people who call themselves idealists, but they're really pessimists. Everything is seen through the prism of that darkness. And then there are some people who say that ultimately, again, they are idealists, but in reality, they're just a bit too overly optimistic. We're going to discuss this in just a moment. Everything is great. Everything is fantastic. Everything is beautiful. That's not a proper perception of the world either. So he says, what's the proper perception? Listen to this. He says, Lo elu vi elu yaviu geula. This is amazing. Neither the so called realists, who are really pessimists in disguise, or the idealists, who are really just unanchored optimists, neither of these people can really be productive in life. So, who is the cohort that we are looking to join? So he says, Elo anu optimim kilomar. So he says, so rather again, says Rav Aviner, we have to be optimists. But really, what we're looking to be is idealistic realists. Idealistic realists. And how do you become an idealistic realist? Kilomar, you do him shebecheshbon kolal hatov gover alara. So on one hand, again, I'm optimistic. What does Judaic optimism mean? It means that at the end of the day, I believe good will always win. Good will always win. It might not win today, and it might not win tomorrow, but at the end of the day, whenever that end of day is, good will always come out on top. That's my optimism. And if I keep on the right derech in life, and I keep on the right path, the right trajectory, I will come out on top when, how, what, where. Those are variables that remain to be seen. And in a dynamic fashion, good always wins. St put, align yourself with the camp of good. Align yourself with the camp of tov. And my idealism, I should say, my optimism tells me things will work out. Paragraph Gimel. Skip down a little bit. He says, he says, So listen to this. So we'll say the rest of this outside. So I mean, and I think this is so incredible. Because a lot of us, generally, internally, most of us gravitate towards one end of the emotional spectrum. So some of us, by definition, have a predisposition for pessimism. And how do pessimists among us look at the optimists? How do they look at them? Right? 
You're nuts, right? Get, get a life, you know, get, get a little bit more anchored in reality. What are you out there with all the way, oh, we smile, everything's so fantastic. You have days where you want to punch a person like that in the face, right? What are you doing? Come on, don't you live in this world with me? Every, not everything is fine. Not everything is fine. Not everything is okay. And how does the optimist look at the quote-unquote realist who's really a pessimist in disguise? One word. How does, right, how does the optimist look at the pessimist? Nebuch. I feel so sad for you. It must be so dreary and dark to live in your world. Everything is always so terrible. Everything is always sort of having their posits. You can't really be a pessimist because what is life like if you're a pessimist? But you also can't be an unhinged optimist because to be an unhinged optimist means that you ignore the reality of moror in this world of difficulties, trials, and tribulations. So therefore it says, Rav Avina, what am I aiming for? I'm aiming to be an idealistic realist. What does it mean to be an idealistic realist? Number one, good will always win. That's my optimism. Good will always win. That it's true on a, on a, on a national level, and it's true on a personal level. At the end of the day, I have to do what is right in life. And even though sometimes doing what is right causes me some short-term hits, causes me to lose some ground in the short term, it's not a sprint, right? It's a, long, it's a marathon. It's a long-term race. Put, cast your lot with good in life, and ultimately, again, you will persevere. That's my optimism. Where does my realism come in? So this is interesting. Rav Avinir doesn't address this specifically, but I want to tell you where it comes in. If you take a look at number six, with this I'll conclude. So with this I'll conclude. So the, if you notice, this is Halach Ma'anya, first part of the Haggadah. So if you notice again, what we say over here in Halach Ma'anya is, if you look at the end, Hashata Hacha, this year we are here, a reference to diaspora. L'shana Baba Ardi Yisrael, next year in Eretz Yisrael. Hashata Avdi, this year I'm a slave. L'shana Haba Bnei Chore, next year I will be free. Rav Yisrael Meir Lau, in his commentary on his Haggadah, says, I never understood this line. Why do we say, this year I'm here, next year I'm free? Why don't I say what? Now I'm here, and what? What should be the next line? Tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, Mashiach could come anytime. This year, I'm a slave. Next year, what do you mean next year I'll be free? Tomorrow I should be free. In the year I should be free. The car of soon I should be free. What do you mean next year? And Rabbi Lau says something amazing. He says optimism is only powerful and only meaningful if it's anchored in a realistic framework. Does dynamic change occur? Absolutely. But dynamic change usually takes time. So at the end of the day, this year I'm here. Could it be that Mashiach comes and I'm an Eretz Yisrael before Shabbos? A thousand percent. Is that the probability? Probably not. Probably change, especially Messianic change, takes time. This year I'm a slave. And by the way, slavery means different things for each of us. We're all a slave to something. I could, I could go ahead and shake off my shackles. Could I do that in an hour? If I really put my mind to it, I probably could. But realistically, dynamic, cathartic, overwhelming change takes time. This year I'm a slave. Hopefully I'll get it together, and by next year I'll be free. This, I believe, is what Rav Avinar is referring to when he says our goal is to become idealistic realists or idealistic optimists. It means, on one hand, to believe that good will always win out and to recognize again that things will always work out some way, somehow. But that optimism has to be anchored in a framework of reality. And the reality is that sometimes for things to come together as I want it, it's going to take time. Hashata <laughs> hacha. L'shana haba ba'arad Yisrael. Hashata avdi l'shana haba b'nei chorin. You want optimism in life because, you know, there's a big problem. Unhinged or unanchored optimism. You know what it ultimately results in? What happens? If you ever know unhinged or unanchored optimists, what usually happens to them over time? They usually become dissolutions. It might take a little while. But they usually become disillusioned because the visions of grandeur they have for themselves and they have for life don't usually materialize. Optimism is the most powerful koach that a Jew has, but it has to be anchored in a framework, in a construct, ultimately, of reality.
we have to strive to become realistic idealists, realistic optimists. And that posits Rav Aviner and Rabbi Lau is the power of the matzah and the maror. You see, if you just eat them separately, then you run the risk of becoming a maror person, a pessimist. Or matzah separately, you run the risk of what? Becoming just an unhinged optimist. But if you bring them together, then you become a realistic idealist. Then you become an anchored optimist. So if you bring this all together, it turns out that this little hello sandwich absolutely packs a punch, not just in your gastrointestinal tract, <laughs> right? but ultimately, again, in your neshama. And we begin to see now why, even though halachically, we do not accept the view of hello. We do not eat everything together. But ashkafically, the rabbis felt that it was an absolute necessity to build this into the Seder. Why? Well, according to Rabbi Sachs, it reminds us that we often in life vacillate between two states. On any given day, if you ask me how I'm doing, there's one of two answers, and that is either it's a murder day or it's a matzah day. Very rarely is life somewhere in between. I usually vacillate between those two states. But when I'm in a state of matzah, or I should say, when I'm in a state of murder and things are difficult, it's important to maintain my matzah optimism and realize I will get through this. I will be okay. I will survive. I will remain standing. And when I'm in a matzah state, it's important for me to know that even though my life is great right now, I have to be ever aware and cognizant of the difficulties, of the trials and tribulations that are occurring all around me. Or alternatively, what ultimately Rav Avinia and Rav Lau teach us is that the matzah and Mara combination are very important. Because the mar represents the bitterness of pessimism. The matzah represents the beautiful, the sweetness. Matzah is sweet. You know, by the way, when you take that first bite of matzah at the Seder, there's nothing more delicious in the world. So you think it's because you're starving. It's not because you're starving. It's because your neshama knows that there is no more beautiful word, food, to ingest than the bread of freedom. That is the bread of optimism. And so ultimately, again, those, there are those who are mar eaters of pessimism. There are those who are matzah eaters of optimism. To eat either one of them alone is exceptionally dangerous. And therefore, what do we do in the Haggadah? What do we do in the Seder? Zeichel l'mikdash kehillah. Kein asa hill b'zman shebeis ha-mikdash hayakayim hayakorich Pesach matzah umaror ba'ochlan yachad. The successful Jew ultimately knows that you can't live life as a pessimist because that is a horrible existence. But I also can't live life as an unhinged, unanchored optimist because that runs the risk of disillusionment. The well-balanced Jew knows that you have to take your matzah, you have to take your mara, you have to take your pessimism, but you have to blunt your pessimism, turn it into idealism by going ahead and wrapping it together with matzah. But my optimism also has to be anchored in a sense of reality. And if you eat your matzah and your mara together, Hillel tells us there is no telling what we could accomplish. A little bit of pessimism, tempered with some optimism, creates healthy, idealistic realism. That's the equation. A little bit of matzah of optimism plus some maror of pessimism equals idealistic realism. And when you inculcate within yourself idealistic realism, there is no telling what you can accomplish. So ultimately, as we prepare for the Yom Tov of Pesach, we often get very consumed by the details of preparation. And there are many, many details. And we're supposed to get consumed by them. But it's also an opportunity to ask ourselves, do we need a little bit of life disposition recalibration? Do we need a little bit of recalibration of how we look at ourselves, how we look at the world? Because sometimes many of us have, have, have a, consumed a bit too much maror, whereas others have consumed a bit too much matzah. Pesach is the incredible opportunity to get the perfect balance of ultimately, again, the bitterness of Maror with the beautiful optimism of Matzah. And we should be Zohar Mir Hashem to enter into this Yom Tiv and to certainly emerge with this Yom Tiv with this healthy dose of idealistic realism, prepared to take on the challenges of life, prepared to encounter all of the struggles, but never losing our incredible hope, never losing our optimism, never losing the belief in ourselves, in our nation that we could overcome any obstacle. Thank you. Ken, we want to thank Rabbi Silver for giving this year, and of course, trust the assistant, uh, Julian. The um, Shmirz Hashem, the final one, at least for this um, 
the Shalash for Golim uh, will be before Shul, June 4th, God willing. We will, God willing, also give more advance notice so people can attend. This is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you other. Thank you again. Please enjoy the rest. I think there's also some cookies there for dessert. So you have to say karma according to according to hello. Yeah. According to this, yeah. Hey, it must be that karma pesach represents some synthesis. Yeah.